Good morning, everyone. Hope that you had a good uh, weekend and a great start to the week. Let's pray and we'll get into what we've been learning from the book of Hebrews. I want to request somebody from our class to please go ahead and lead us with a word of prayer. Uh, let's pray. Yeah. Father God, we come before your presence in the mighty name of Jesus. As we begin our class on the book of Hebrews, Lord, I pray that Lord, you will bless Pastor Nancy with your wisdom and insight, Lord. Whatever he, uh, she teaches us, Lord God, you will enable each one of us, all our classmates, to have the spirit of wisdom and understanding so that we can understand, Lord. Holy Spirit, you teach us and lead us throughout the sessions, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Thank you, uh, Zeli. Let's go back to our text here. So in the last class, we were in Hebrews chapter 4. We continued from Hebrews chapter 3, where we spoke about um, the greatness of our Lord Jesus Christ as compared to Moses. Moses was but a leader chosen by God, but the Lord Jesus is the son of God and the leader above Moses, the leader of everyone. And so we saw how the author established the greatness of Jesus Christ above Moses because he was talking to a Jewish audience and he knew the uh, honor that they placed upon Moses as one of their patriarchs. And then we went on to read about the encouragement that he gave these believers to have a soft heart or a heart that responds quickly to the promptings of God. And uh, he, he uh, reminded them not to be so discouraged so that they um, shut God's voice off. And uh, we, we saw that he was talking about responding today. If you hear the voice of the Lord today, then uh, you know you need to respond. Don't be like those who harden their heart in the rebellion. So we saw a little bit about the children of Israel and how they, uh, they did not trust God even though God performed his many miracles. Uh, and so it shows the kind of heart that they carried. It was a hard heart. It was a rebellious heart. And uh, they did not respond to God. And that, that is something that we must stay away from. And then he went on to talking about something called as God's rest uh, in the end of the third chapter. And... Uh, in the fourth chapter, he talks about God's rest, entering God's rest. And he says that seven days of uh, God's work in the beginning of creation involved one day of rest. So on that seventh day, God rested after creating everything for six days. And God also invites us to enter his rest. Uh, so there is something known as the rest of God that we can all experience. And we broadly understood that the rest of God has to do with salvation by grace and, sal and not by works. So that is the broad meaning. Uh, we also saw how when God took the example of the children of Israel and uh, kept saying that they did not enter the rest, they did not enter the rest, it felt like uh, we were being told about the promised land, that the children of Israel did not enter the promised land. So maybe the promised land was that ultimate rest that God's people needed. But obviously we know that that wasn't the ultimate. That's why God still continues to talk about entering his rest, meaning there is a kind of rest in God that all believers can experience. It's a place where we come to, where uh, we have peace, we have satisfaction um, you know we we have the sense of being refreshed in god and that place can only be experienced if we are walking by faith and we saw how uh, in these passages there is a lot of uh, focus on unbelief and how that is harmful and uh, staying in faith 
and how that enables us to enter the rest of god so the rest of god is not necessarily the promised land even though you know god used that as the example uh, and said that the children of israel did not enter because of unbelief because of disobedience because of rebellion and so now we know that there is a rest of god which is beyond that promised land uh, which you and i can experience it's firstly salvation but uh, even beyond that there is uh, something in god that is available for all of us now uh, obviously uh, you know the the person who re who led the children of israel to uh, that promised land or place of rest was joshua and we saw in uh, hebrews chapter 4 and verse 8 we saw how uh, we were told that if joshua had given them rest then he would not afterward have spoken of another day right so uh, one point that i didn't make in the last classes uh, it's also seen that you know jesus that word um, actually joshua uh, he reminds us of jesus okay so joshua brought people into the promised land uh, or the place of rest but even jesus for that matter for many years people were were waiting upon the lord for the fulfillment of all the practices you know, that they had under the old covenant but ultimately it was jesus very similar to joshua who led us into the fulfillment of those promises that unfinished um, you know uh, uh, sort of it felt unfinished that people were were um, uh, worshiping in the temple and uh, you know praying to god in the temple and doing all those things but when jesus came uh, you know he completed that work of redemption and he finished it all and he was the one who made the way for us to enter into that salvation you know that he had to offer so he's he's kind of it's sort of uh, said in some places that he's that a picture of joshua who brought us into the promises so these were uh, you know some of the things that we looked at and we also saw how the word of god is powerful um, we were told that the word of god is living and powerful sharper than any two-edged sword and that the word of god within us helps us discern uh, right from wrong the things of the spirit uh, as compared to the things of the soul now let's keep moving on towards the end of uh, chapter 4 we come to a place where we are told that uh, uh, jesus is our compassionate high priest so i think i'll pick up from here uh, let's quickly go to verse 13 so verse 12 we saw about the word of god verse 13 of chapter 4 it says there is no creature hidden from his sight but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account so basically he's just calling um, the the people to recognize that god sees everyone's hearts and uh, it's it's important for us to carry a heart of faith and carry a heart that trusts in the lord and in verse 14 he he says seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast our confession uh, remember we said that a high priest must be chosen from among the people who uh, can represent the people well who's gone through the experiences that people have been through and so the lord jesus became a high priest once he put on humanity and the speciality of this high priest is that he has passed through the heavens which no other high priest has ever done and therefore we can place confidence in this high priest he did not die or come to an end like the other high priest he's just passed through the heavens and moved on right in the uh, uh, in what god has assigned him to do he completed his mandate and moved on to the next assignment and so jesus is that great high priest to us in verse 15 once again we are encouraged that this high priest whom we have he can he knows our weaknesses and he uh, can sympathize with us and so he is able to help us right like whenever we go through any kind of temptation or whenever we go through any kind of difficulty and the way he lived was he was very pure 
even that is stated in verse 15 because he was ten tempted at all points yet without sin so all of these these um uh aspects make him a great high priest and we can hold on to the promises of god for us in the word of god without a sense of uh, doubt confusion or anxiety because he's the most reliable high priest and in verse 16 we have an invitation it says because we have such a great high priest let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need so we have a high priest who um can release grace into our situations uh, and, and so we can approach him you know no matter what we are going through we can reach out to him it's also an invitation to prayer so what is this throne of grace come boldly to the throne of grace it's nothing but an invitation to prayer where uh, the author is is saying that uh, yes we may be going through a very challenging time but one thing we can always do, you know, no matter we, you know, it's a good time or a challenging time, is to come to God in prayer. We can directly approach the throne of grace. Up until that time, again, if we, uh, excuse me, recall the the way the temple was set up and the assignment given to the priests under the, uh, you know, like the um, Aaronic line, we know that only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies and a uh, common man could never be able to do that. But because of what Jesus has done, this verse 16 is so precious because it's an invitation to everyone, uh, even to those Jews whom the author is talking to. They could never have dreamed of entering into the holy of holies but now he's telling them look something greater has been done through our lord jesus christ and uh, you can enter directly into the presence of this almighty god and how can you come in come in boldly without any fear because jesus has finished the work for us come in boldly to obtain what obtain mercy and grace so Pray at all times, pray because you know we have a prayer answering God. If we go back to passages like Philippians 4, right? Uh, like bring everything to God with, with prayer and uh, you know, thanksgiving. So that's the way we need to live our lives. Uh, pray about everything and don't let discouragement, um, you know, sort of uh, grip our hearts so it's it's just encouragement he's constantly trying to say the same thing in different ways uh, and uh, he's just asking the people to hold on uh, during their tough times and recognize that what they have right now is so much greater than all uh, of what their forefathers experienced and uh, they are now in the very fulfillment of the scriptures through the finished work of our lord jesus christ so he he wants them to awaken he wants them to arise and uh, uh, really take a hold of the precious thing that God has given them, right? Uh, and, you know, during discouragement, it happens that sometimes we don't recognize the worth and value of what has been given to us. And it seems like these people were going through that. You know, they were comparing um, the, the temporary lack the temporary limitations the temporary pain that we're going that they were going through um you know to to what maybe others uh, around them had and their perspective was fixed on what they didn't have and what others had whereas the author is saying look you, your perspective needs to move it needs to have the focus on something greater you know, the works of uh, Jesus, salvation, uh, the rest of God and other amazing eternal things that have been given to you. Not that these issues will not be addressed. They will be addressed. You pray, but uh, rejoice in the greater aspects of, of uh, who you have become and who God is. So that is kind of the call that comes to them. Now let's look at chapter 5 here here again uh, you know he will invite them to that place of waking up and maturing in god so there is a continuation about the uh, 
high priestly ministry of the lord jesus christ so let's uh, quickly go through it i know we probably touched upon it briefly in the last uh, class the first few scriptures here uh, they just say that jesus did not become a high priest by himself but it was given to him because for somebody to become a high priest god had to ordain them and that's exactly the how the high priests were appointed even you know back in the time of moses and those who were uh, part of the line of aaron were the only ones who could be appointed and we see that in exodus chapter 28 and from verse 5 onwards um uh, we we saw how jesus is called as the begotten once again part of the trinity where jesus is called as the son of god uh, and uh, begotten by the father verse 6 onwards we saw how you know jesus went on to uh, experience the pain in in this world you know as he was fulfilling god's plan a uh, mandate of becoming that sacrifice for us and we know that he was already perfect but because he was obedient and he suffered he went through the pain uh, we see that there was something greater right like uh, that again it it though the scripture says that he was perfected having been perfected in verse 9 it doesn't mean he was not perfect but the way he dealt with sufferings was commendable uh, it was a very righteous uh, manner in which he went through his sufferings so that also adds to the credibility or the the position of our lord jesus christ that's all that it means it doesn't mean that he was imperfect in any way and the order under which jesus became the high priest we saw that it was the order of melchizedek and we will come to that later uh, because we have an entire chapter uh, or most of the chapter that talks about melchizedek so we were at i think verse 7 and 8 where uh, okay let's move on let's just uh, move to verse 11 here we go to the next section now we've seen about jesus as a high priest how he suffered how he was perfected through his obedience um, unto god so let's uh, jump to verse 11 now could somebody please read from verse 11 to verse 14 please and then we can explain it of whom we have much to say and hard to explain hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing for though by this time you ought to be teachers you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of god and you have come to need milk and not solid food for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness for he is a babe but solid food belongs to those who are of full age of full age that is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil yes thank you zeli um as we can see here attached to his information about you know um Jesus as high priest and the great high priest and uh, you know for people to put their attention or focus on Jesus attached to that he is calling people to grow up in God now why would he be uh, wanting them to do that uh, because you know when we look at the natural as well right uh, hopefully when we are adults we have a greater focus we are not distracted easily by um, you know small little things that we are missing out now if you take a little child uh, for example and you know the little child did not get a pencil or a pen that it desired the whole day can be bad for that child because it's crying i didn't get that pen or they they're distracted by small little things but if you look at somebody who's matured and is an adult now maybe we didn't get 
a pen or you know something we like but we know how to move on we know how to prioritize the day and go about doing things that we need to during that day so that is maturity so similarly what he's telling the people is that they're so caught up in the things that uh, uh, they they seem to be missing out the things that are discouraging them that it's almost become a distraction for them and it is hindering their journey with the lord it's hindering their growth with the lord uh, which is so problematic so for us as well you know, there is a call to maturity so here he states uh, he says things like um, you know in verse 11 he says of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing so he's saying that immaturity is a place which will uh, which will sort of uh, cover our uh, how do i put it basically it does not allow our understanding to expand uh there are things that he wants to tell these believers about god about the kingdom of god you know about the reality of these spiritual truths but he's saying you've become dull of hearing okay i want to tell you a lot of things but what does immaturity do immaturity keeps us in a place where we are not able to grasp the depth of god's word uh, the depth of the truth of god's word okay so that's a risk or a danger that uh, we can encounter if we keep ourselves in a place of immaturity he goes on to verse 12 and he says that uh, immaturity stunts the growth of people in verse 12 he says for though by this time you ought to be teachers you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of god and you have come to need milk and not solid food so he's telling them that they've not grown only they've become stunted so these are the problems of immaturity one is immaturity makes us dull of hearing we are not able to grasp the deep truths of god anymore second it uh, keeps us in a position where we've not moved on to the next stage or the next step right we got stuck in the previous step so for these believers the desire that the writer of the hebrews had is that they would become teachers of the word right so now they've grown so much in god that uh, hopefully they have good understanding and they should be able to teach other believers and encourage other believers under them but what's happening right now they don't seem to have that capacity they've not become teachers of the word that means that you know they've missed out on that next level where they could have actually been uh, so that's another danger of immaturity and he says you have come to need milk and not solid food so he's just making a comparison of the the uh, truths in the word of god and he says that there are some which are so simple to understand okay which he's calling as milk that any new believer in christ um, is able to easily digest or receive whereas solid food would be some of the deeper truths which somebody who's matured in christ is able to receive is able to digest but he's looking at these believers and he's saying look your discouragement is keeping you in a place where you're not able to digest the deeper things of god right so that's another danger what did we say we said dull of hearing stunted growth and now he's saying um not able to receive or grasp deeper truths of god and in verse 13 he says for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness for he is a babe next is he says unskilled in the word of righteousness that simply means that uh, the scriptures the knowledge of the scriptures the application of the scriptures you know in our walk with the lord that somebody who's immature is not able to again understand it and apply it so he's saying unskilled you don't know how to deal with the word of god how to live by the word of god so that again is a sign of immaturity and he calls uh, an immature christian as a babe 
so he's literally looking at these people and he's saying you're immature you're immature in so many different ways okay uh, and uh, it's really uh, something for us to look at consider and learn from in verse 14 he says but solid food belongs to those who are of full age that is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil full age is referring to somebody who is mature in the lord so somebody who is mature in the lord how should they be he says that they take solid food very similar to how things are in the natural someone who is an adult will be able to um, you know eat more complex food compared to a baby who needs to be fed uh, simpler forms of food so an adult or a mature believer will be able to uh, you know uh, like receive from god's word receive you know all kinds of truth from god's word uh, and he also says by reason of use have their senses exercised Okay, so what has happened? How did one get to maturity? How did one get to that position of full age? It's not like, you know, they, they were born in the Lord yesterday and then they just showed up as a full a person of full age. But they have exercised by reason of use, have exercised their senses. So it shows us the path to maturity. What is that path? To to remain in the word of God, to uh, learn the word of God, to understand the word of God. You know, if you go back to the parable of the sower, the way the Lord Jesus taught us, he said, the seed, which is the word of God, it is sown, it develops roots. So, you know, he talked about how one who hears the word must first understand it and must keep it in their hearts. They must, they must not let, you know, persecution or, um, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the pride of life, take away the word uh, outside of us. So to be able to receive the word, understand it, keep it in the midst of all circumstances, situations. And he says, by reason of use, meaning we are, we are applying the word, we are walking with the Lord, we are practicing, you know, that word in our lives. And maturity comes like that. Maturity cannot come without exercising the the word you know day to day and that's the path to maturity so even the situation or the circumstance that these people found themselves in it was a great opportunity for them to apply the word and to walk with the lord and grow up in the lord so that's the way it should have been but he looks at the believers and he feels so sad and he says no but there are so many signs of immaturity instead you know among all of you and he also uh, states here talking about one of full age we said they're able to receive greater truths they have exercised by reason of use uh, they have their senses exercised that also we we saw and he says able to discern both good and evil so somebody who's more mature uh, in their walk with the Lord is also able to tell what is right from wrong. You know, what is really from God, what is not from God. They're able to discern these things. So these are all signs of maturity. Okay, but uh, if one is not mature, then uh, what what happens? They can be easily distracted, or they can be easily deceived. Even, uh, in fact, there are certain scriptures, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 14 through 16, where we are told that a baby Christian or an immature Christian, you know, they will easily be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Meaning, what happens is when one is not strong in the word, um, a lot of new teachings come up. And, you know, it, uh, it happens in every season uh, and particularly as we move closer and closer towards the return of our Lord Jesus, we'll all see that all kinds of uh, teaching will crop up around us and people will subscribe to uh, doctrines that may be strange or even sometimes they're very subtly off from there are scriptures that people use, but then, you know, they subtly, they take us away from the uh, core truth of what the scriptures are actually saying. So we, 
really need to be very discerning. But if one is immature, then what happens? The moment we hear these teachings, we get excited. And you know, we may have this reaction of, uh, oh, how profound, how deep, and we get caught up in wrong teachings. Um, and that's a danger, you know, particularly in these last days, as uh, many wrong teachings may come up around us. So every uh, wind of doctrine being tossed to and fro, that is the way uh, immature Christian will respond uh, because their hearts are not established in the doctrines of God's word. Or other signs that we see of immaturity are also uh, of running behind people. Now, uh, if we look at uh, the Corinthian church, you know, Paul rebuked the believers there because they were saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos. That was a sign of immaturity. And he told them, you know, why are you doing um, uh, this? Why are you creating factions? And why are you uh, elevating men? You know, is, is Paul someone? Is Apollo someone? Did they die for you? Uh, wasn't it Jesus Christ that Jesus should be elevated and not human beings? So, uh, what happens to believers when they are not yet, uh, you know, solid in the word of God? There is a tendency to run into these wrong doctrines or run behind people and, uh, you know, make, make them the ideal and actually be distracted. So seems like these, these Hebrew believers were in that position. And so he's warning them and he's saying, you know, the signs of immaturity, uh, it's, it's better we come out of it. Uh, by now, you should have been teachers of the word. So what does that mean? One is a teacher or one can be a teacher when they, um, you know, they know the, the truth, right? Maybe if, if not to perfection, at least a little better than the person to whom they are teaching, they are sharing. Uh, but unfortunately, these believers did not get a hold of the word, not even enough to be able to teach the very next, uh, maybe, you know, set of believers under them. And of course, they did not have discernment, right? How does discernment come? We've already talked about it. And we said so much that it comes with maturity. It's, it comes with um, uh, exercising ourselves, right? By reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern. So when we keep journeying with the Lord, keep spending time in the word, keep growing in that manner, that is when we will develop a strong discerning spirit where we will be able to tell good from evil. Quickly, we can pick it up. Oh, wrong doctrine? We would be able to sense that. You know, hey, this looks very good, sounds very good, but I'm just feeling like something is off. Right? It comes with maturity. And so he is encouraging the believers and he's saying, you know, you need to move towards maturity. Don't be so distracted and don't remain in a position of immaturity. Okay. So uh, later we will go to chapter six, which talks about um, falling away. Okay, that's also one of the difficult passages uh, in the Bible. But let's pause for a moment and talk a little bit about what we've discussed so far. I think about maturity, immaturity as believers, anything that you all want to share, we can discuss and then we'll go to chapter 6. Yes, yes, Jafina, please go ahead. Yeah. So when it says the first principles of the oracles of God, does it uh, indicate something specifically or it's just about the basic gospel or something? Yeah, so good question um, there, Jafina. So when it says that you know one must uh, move on from the first principles of the oracles of god uh, in verse 12 we'll come back to it in the beginning of uh, hebrews chapter 6 where again he will talk about elementary principles and he'll make a list 
okay so uh, over here it is it lists out things like uh, uh, foundation for repentance from dead works faith toward god uh, doctrine of baptisms laying on of hands basic things so that's what it means basic truths for a believer So what is ministry all about? Why do we why do we do ministry? Why why are we all doing what we're doing? One is of course to worship God, so that's our Okay, so to Jeffina says to serve, to build people in Christ. Okay, that's correct. Um, now, that's true. Uh, and when we even go back to passages like uh, Ephesians chapter 4, you know, uh, from verse 11 to verse 13, over there we see that God has given the fivefold ministry offices, okay, to, uh, to equip the saints, okay, for the for the work of the ministry and that's the reason all of us have a ministry to do but ultimately what's happening is that so that we can all be shaped into that perfect man okay we can be we can what is that perfect man or uh, verse 13 ephesians 4 verse 13 uh, that term there is telios nothing but maturity that all believers can mature in christ so even as we serve uh, in ministry. One is that we are serving the Lord. Second is we are building people up to maturity. Okay, So uh, that thought is very helpful no matter what we do, whether we are praying, leading worship, we are teaching the word. In, in doing anything and everything that we do, what are we actually trying to do? We are helping move people towards maturity, building up building them up into maturity in Christ. So that is the responsibility that God has given us. Okay, And that was the expectation of the author of Hebrews. So uh, any other comments before we um, go to the next chapter here? Okay, so quite a lot said there about uh, growing up in God. Now let's move on to chapter 6 here. Uh, and as Jeffina asked, what are those first principles? It's stated in verses 1 to 3. Uh, I will read it quickly for us. It says, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Again, that perfection, Greek Tiliotis or Tilios, uh, it simply refers to maturity or completeness. And then it says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God, doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So basically, again, he's talking about maturity and the capacity to grasp deeper truths. And he sort of seems uh, to mention this list as elementary or like first principles, you know, like uh, ABC of uh, faith for any young believer. I don't think this list is complete in the sense that just because it is mentioned here, we take it as, oh, this is ABC. We have to teach this to all the young believers uh, and uh, only then teach other things. It may not work like that. He's just listed out a few things. There can be many others that he has actually uh, missed over here. But, uh, you know, he's done a good job of listing out as many basic teachings as required. Uh, and he says, you know, uh, it, it's good to keep talking about these basics but you know one needs to move on from here also if and when we move on if we find time it's good to revisit them 
and you know sort of uh, be established in them now let's go to verse 4 now this is the difficult passage that you know we said we would be looking at so let's read from verse 4 to verse 8 can somebody please read it please for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the holy spirit and have tasted the good word of god and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they cannot since they crucify again for themselves the son of god and put him to an open shame for the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings blessing from god but if it bears thorns and briars it is rejected and near to be cursed whose end is to be burned mm. yes amen thank you roslyn so when we uh, look at what the author is saying uh, he's putting it quite directly now so far he said don't be immature okay we better grow up in christ and now he's saying look there is a huge danger a huge danger that uh, one could move towards if they are not careful and that is called as falling away now remember that falling away is different from falling will a believer make mistakes yes uh, could a believer uh, you know commit sin in their journey yes uh, we know that these things happen right and uh, as long as a believer recognizes that what they have done is wrong and sincerely come back to the lord repent of their mistake or their sin we know that there is provision uh, in the blood of jesus to cleanse us right there is provision uh, in the work of the cross for us to be restored so uh, that is that is understood Okay, so we are not talking about falling now when we talk about falling we know there is a, a scripture in proverbs 24 and verse 16 that says for a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again but the wicked shall fall by calamity so falling and rising up in our walk with the lord that may happen sometimes uh, it, it's very sad that some believers may do it knowingly uh, making mistakes which is not pleasing to god but most of the time i think uh, when we are sincerely trying to follow god uh, mistakes happen unintentionally right but either way if we are wanting to follow the lord uh, we know that god has provided for our forgiveness and we don't you know take it lightly now having spoken about falling now let's come back to falling away now falling away is a completely different um uh you know thing that can happen to a believer so i'll just introduce it and we'll discuss it uh, you know in the next class elaborately so here he says if there is a believer and he uses descriptions such as once enlightened tasted the heavenly gift become partakers of the holy spirit tasted the good word of god and the powers of the age to come so what are these characteristics they describe a believer they describe a born again spirit filled believer he's not talking about you know just anybody falling away no no it is a born again spirit filled believer yet what happens to this believer if they fall away verse 6 and in verse 4 he said it is impossible so scary right it is impossible for such a believer if they fall away for them to be renewed to repentance okay so that is the scary part so he's saying look if there is someone as a believer who um, maybe willfully they go into a sin and they are unrepentant uh, if they willfully reject the lord jesus christ if they let go of their faith 
and they just choose you know a, a life of uh, uh, selfishness whatever but away from god they say okay i don't believe in jesus anymore i don't believe in the work of the cross anymore then they put themselves in a position of no no return okay it's really scary because the bible uses strong terms it's not even saying it is hard for such a believer to journey back or you know it it is going to be difficult no it is impossible for somebody who's been so strong with the lord when they reject the lord for them to even be renewed back to repentance so it's a place where we as believers don't want to go like don't even go you know how far is far uh, sometimes little children do that they try to test the boundaries right like how much can i get away with you know can I, if i do this will my mama ma mom and dad uh, give me a whack if they don't okay let me try little more little more so they push themselves to the point where like finally mom and dad are angry and they give them a whack but for us as children of god how far can i go you know how much sin can i sort of uh, uh, play with how much fire can i play with uh, how much is still safe for me you know where does the boundary line lie that's a very dangerous lifestyle for a believer when we know that something has the tendency to get us away from god just escape run right just turn around and run the way joseph ran that's the best way to walk with the lord anything that has the the resemblance of sin the smell of sin you know just stay away because we don't want to move towards this very risky and dangerous position where uh falling away might happen right so uh we'll talk about it we'll talk more about it um uh, but i'm just going to stop here but any thoughts before we pray and close for today or yeah uh, maybe you okay anything that you want to say no okay great all right then let's pray and uh, we will wrap up okay i just want to request one of us on the call to lead in prayer i'll pray yes yes Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for every single truth that we learned today, God. God, help us to uh, always stay by your word, abide in your words, stay in your presence so that uh, we can keep getting uh, mature in this life. We can keep understanding the truth. Uh, fill us with your Holy Spirit, Jesus. Teach us and guide us uh, towards the best pathway on this life, Jesus. We want to learn more about you. Be with us and help us on this journey. And we thank you for Pastor Nancy who has taught us the truth. And uh, we I thank you for all my classmates over here. We thank you for the blessed time that we have got. And God, I pray that whatever we have learned, we will apply it in our life and uh, will be blessed and will also be a blessing to others. We thank you. We glorify your name. We lift your name up above everything else. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Jeffina. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. We shall meet in the next class.